Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Journey to the East, where we'll be meeting technology, industrial leaders, and visionaries, and learning their adventure with China. First, we are very excited to welcome our first speaker, Linda Kosmowski. She's the Chief Operating Officer of Evernote. Evernote first entered China market about three years ago and quickly just had one million users within the first year. Actually, Evernote's first international data center is in China. To learn more, Linda will be joining us a fireside chat with Samin Farid, director of Legend Star Silicon Valley. Let's welcome. Um, so nice to meet everybody. My name is Salman Farid, and uh, maybe we can give a big round of applause to Linda for being here today. Thanks for uh, taking the time to chat. Um, so, uh, as most of you know, the topic today is going to be about um, how different companies uh, from the U.S. are entering China. And so, um, Evernote, I think, is one of the rare examples that's done a really fantastic job um, of entering China, both by having a great team on the ground and um, really localizing the brand and building a really great product. Um, so, maybe first we can just talk a little bit about the company and about the recent change on the executive team. I know uh, Chris has just recently joined, and so we wanted to you know, wh why do you think this was a really good time for that change? And as, as Evernote scales, you know, what are some exciting things that are on the horizon? So yes, uh, Chris O'Neill joined us about two weeks ago uh, as our new CEO. Um, Phil Libin has been talking for a really long time about the fact that we wanted to build a 100-year startup. And um, without medical advances, it's pretty much impossible for him to be the CEO of the entire time. So uh, he's always said that one of his most important jobs is to find our next CEO. And, and I think we found that in Chris. Um, he's, he's a great person to sort of take us to the next phase of growth for the company. He has a great track record. And, uh, and you know, there's, there's lots ahead. Those really exciting times ahead for uh, everyone. Um, just now in the back, you were telling me that 75% um, of Evernote's users now are uh, outside the U.S. So I think that's really an incredible feat for an American company uh, to achieve. So I think uh, China being one of probably the biggest markets uh, in general and probably for Evernote as well. Um, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the steps you guys have taken, some of the strategies. Um, so I guess the first question is how did you guys decide you wanted to go and enter China? At what point in the company's growth do you think now is the time to do it? So the, the benefit of the fact that Evernote is an app um, is we can actually see where people are naturally adopting, uh, uh, adopting our, our application and our service. And China was one of the countries that started developing very, very quickly and very early. So unlike uh, where it used to be that companies would have to make a decision about what market to enter based on opportunity, we could already see that there was passion and there was interest in our products just based on the people that were finding Evernote on their own. Um, so we decided to set up an office three years ago and actually establish a local team there. And, and yes, we're now 15, uh, 15 million users in China, and it is actually our, our second largest market behind the U.S. So it's been extremely successful for us, and having a local team has been a crucial part of that success. We knew immediately that we wanted to really establish a presence that felt right for China, uh, both a local team and a local service. So, um, speaking about the team, I think probably a lot of uh, companies here in the U.S. are now thinking about entering China. So, what are some qualities that you thought were important in finding the right team there? What kind of, what kind of person can be? Well, first of all, it's worth, it's worth mentioning it is extremely important to have a local team. I think a lot of people just assume that you can send someone over from the United States to start an office and it's going to be effective, and, and that really is, I think, a mistake. Um, so you need somebody who is very passionate about the product, very committed to growth, um, very creative and very aggressive, because you want someone who's not going to just wait for things to happen, but to really go after it. And also someone who understands the balance of, um, of multiple cultures and, and working in a company that is a Silicon Valley based company, but really wants to be a local Chinese entity and, and kind of walk both of those worlds. But I would say for us, it's always been about passion and creativity. That's kind of number one. I think that's uh, funny that you mentioned passion. I think Evernote is one of those brands that people always think of as people are fanatic about <laughs> using Evernote. Everybody who uses it just constantly talks about how amazing it is. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm addicting myself as well. So um, I think it's, you know, you probably had an easier time than most finding the right team. 
Um, but kind of in terms of product um, and, and building a brand in China, um, what were kind of your experiences, what were some of the really difficult things about being, being a brand new entrant into a whole new market, it speaks a different language, um, and, and you know, what kind of partners did you look for, what kind of partners did you seek out going forward? So a few things. First, we, we really looked for local um, investors that could help us grow the business and give us the right, uh, right information to help us grow in China. Um, second, we knew that we needed to preserve the passion behind the brand, but also still look for a unique identity in China, which I can talk a little bit more about. And then I think beyond that, it was thinking about how do we partner with the right groups to sort of increase our distribution and, and get more recognition um, around the around the, the country in a way that, that resonates with Evernote. But I think the brand story in particular is one of the more interesting because when Evernote came into China, we already had a significant audience there. We also, our international service also has um, Chinese language support. So when we were starting the Yinchang BG service, we really wanted to think about the brand there and make sure that it resonated with people. And so we had our users pick the name. So when you have people that are as passionate about the product as, as our users are, you want to give them some ownership and some, some stake in, in the brand. So we actually held a contest on social media to choose the name, and that's how Yin Cheng Biji was, was decided upon. It's such a perfect name. <laughs> it's really, uh, really cool. Um, and so what are some other you know, tactics in terms of building a brand that you guys thought? Were maybe just some interesting anecdotes about what you were able to do. Well, our team in China really has been brilliant in, in um, thinking about how to connect with the users, and social media has been one of the most important ways to do that. Looking at how we actually not just talk to our users about product features or, um, or, or exactly how to use the product, but also just identifying with them. We say good morning, we say good night to them every day. We um, give inspirational ideas, not just, not just feature information. Um, so that's a key part of it. We've also done quite a few really pretty spectacular events, and that's really driven a lot of direct engagement with the brand by letting people interact physically with the physical products that we sell in addition to the app itself. Um, with the team, our team you know, mans all those events themselves so they can talk to people who have been with Evernote for sometimes five and six years if they started um, in one of the other offices. And so really just building that personal connection about how people understand that we are here for the user experience and we're listening to them and we're actually taking feedback from all of our global audiences and bringing it back into the US product. So speaking of that user experience, um, probably you know, it's well documented how different user behavior is uh, in China versus kind of in the US with this Western context. So um, did you guys um, think that it would be wise to make tweaks to your product specifically for China? both in terms of kind of UI features, um, or did you think it was better to have a more unified brand all across? We've always taken the position that our product should be a very, very high quality product, and it should be the same product around the world. So rather than taking the position of we should customize the product for China, what we actually do is we take learnings from China and try to actually add them to the global product. Because the ideas that are coming out of China are quite innovative and really very influential in how we can kind of grow our global product. So we do maintain the same product around the world, including in China, um, but we focus on really providing a very premium experience to make sure that all of our users around the world are getting the same great experience. And, and a lot of that feedback does come from our China users. Yeah, that's uh, fantastic, really, really interesting. Um, so, in terms of partnerships, I know you guys uh, partnered with China Broadband Capital going in. Um, in terms of operationally, uh, are you guys looking for new partners in China? What kinds of partners do you think make the most sense? And this is also probably a recommendation for a lot of new companies who are looking uh, at the China market. What kinds of people should they be looking to? Um, and what kind of skills do you think are important? We're always looking for partnerships, and as a matter of fact, a big part of Evernote's secret to global growth has been about our partnership program. And specifically in China, we really, really want to continue to build our relationships with both the hardware as well as some of the, the carriers um, and service providers that can help with distribution. So there's, we've grown quite well organically in China um, to date. But it's really about that next level of partnership that can bring us to millions and millions of people 
through a brand that also makes sense with us. So anything when it comes to high quality devices that are being built out of China and distributed around the world, we're already working with several of those companies now. But also whether it's carriers or, um, or credit card companies, banks, et cetera, those are really the types of people that can help propel Evernote to the next level. And we can also bring a lot of our brand recognition and sort of excitement around innovation to their companies as well. Um. So how early do you think is too early for um, a new company to start thinking about expanding into China? Hmm. Um, it's probably a hard question. It's very different, I'm sure, depending on the is, industry and the type it, of company. It's a hard question. It's At the same time, I think it's also an important one, and I think it's one that's changing a lot. The, the idea behind expanding into China is something that you need to take very, very seriously. So. We, we actually had an audience in China for a very long time before we actually set up there. So we mentioned that 75% of Evernote's users are outside of the US. When the company launched in 2008, we already had 50% outside of the US. So almost immediately, people found us even though we were only in English at that time. So you're going to expand whether you want to or not. <laughs> it's just a question on when you actually put people uh, in, that, in that country to dedicate. So again, we've been in China physically for about three years now, and you know that came roughly four years after we, we sort of launched kind of the, the global product. And, and I think that was about the right time for us because we had enough mass in the company to take it seriously and really dedicate the time and the resources. Um, but it might come at a slightly different phase for, for different companies. One important thing I forgot to mention in the previous question about expanding into China that also comes into play here is, is payments. Um, being able to accept different, whether it's Alipay or different types of um, payments in market, that's crucial, but that also does require a certain amount of maturity and, and presence before you can really fully enter because just accepting international credit cards isn't only going to get you so far. Um, actually, speaking of payments, um, you guys just recently also launched a new pricing tier. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how that fits in with China, whether there was a motivation that was correlated or whether it was just worldwide or worldwide? So, um, when Evernote, so Evernote had a free version and a premium version for a long time. The premium version was $45 a year. And that price was pretty much set arbitrarily eight years ago. <laughs> was no, there was no rhyme or reason, there was no research behind it, it was just set. And, and it was never really considered. So last year we started looking at it again and said, okay, should we do a price increase? That was actually the original intention was to do a price increase and how should we look at this? We did about 36 different pieces of research globally to understand what was happening. And what we discovered was in fact, there was a demand outside of the price discussion. There was a demand for a mid tier of the product. So for mobile first users who were really looking for a certain feature set that didn't necessarily need the full premium set, there was an opportunity there. And then once we started realizing that we, we really should be adding another tier of service, then we started backing up and looking at price again. At the same time, we also considered, should we price differently in emerging markets or in different countries? So we started looking at markets like Brazil, Mexico, um, Indonesia, thinking about what our pricing structure should be. And we didn't want to just do a flat discount. We wanted to really understand what is the price that reflects the appropriate value of the product in that country. So we did specific research in China. In addition to launching the mid-tier, we also launched um, new prices in China, which is roughly 40% less than what it is in the US. And that was the price point that demonstrated the right amount of value for the product um, while still maintaining the right level of, of sort of revenue generation. And it's worked quite well. We've actually grown our paid user base in China in the last three months by 156% with the price changes. So it, was, it really was the right move for us. That's fantastic. I think you know, uh, it's really hard to find that balance between um, having a premium product and having something that people are willing to pay for, but uh, at the same time something that's affordable. And then on the other hand, also not starting a price war and turning it into something that everybody's competing, you know, a race to the bottom. Um, and, and that's very, very difficult. Um, so I think we have two minutes left, so maybe we can open up for just one or two questions from the audience. Um, yeah, please.
I'll just repeat the question for the audience. Um, so she was asking about the difficulties in recruiting um, in China. Yeah, so it, it's actually been for us less of a challenge, to be honest with you. We have people that seek us out that really want to work for the company. We're still a fairly small team, to be honest, so we haven't gotten to that point of, of scale yet. And our retention overall has actually been quite good in China as well. Um, I previously worked for Alibaba, and and it was a, you know it, it was a different type of recruiting structure. Our retention has been quite high, and our engagement with our employees has been quite high. So we've been very lucky in that, and that's been true of most of our international teams. They've come to us at events and said, "I really want to work for you," which is part of where I get the compassion piece. So we've been pretty lucky, but it's really about giving people the opportunity to do something they feel is meaningful and they're contributing to something much bigger. That's what we focus on to retain talent. Maybe I'll just repeat the question. So she, she was asking whether uh, entering China as an executive effort is it important to partner with uh, large brands in China or many, many small uh, startups. Um, we've done both in, in different countries. And China specifically, we're really, and, and actually globally, we try to partner actually with larger brands just because we are a fairly small and nimble team. So we're really looking to kind of be as efficient as possible with our distribution. That being said, we have a very, very strong developer program. Our API is completely open. And for the API program, we love to partner with the smaller, more nimble startups that want to integrate with Evernote um, because they can really drive user growth and that, that sort of passionate user base. So we do a little bit of both. But from a corporate partnership standpoint, we focus on the bigger brands. And then from an API and developer standpoint, we focus on those small, aggressive companies. Maybe just one more. Uh, yeah, please. So she was just asking me about how to maintain a good relationship with the government in China and if there's any insights. So I think primarily one of the, one of the things about Evernote is we're a very different type of service. So you know we, we work with individuals and teams. We're not a social network or anything along those lines. So we already have a slightly different view on the product set. Um, but our philosophy has been very clear of we want to be transparent with our users. And that's part of the reason we set up a separate service in China. So we. It, we adhere to Chinese law. We're very co collaborative and cooperative on what we need to do. Um, a lot of our information is private information in that it's just for the user, so it's not as subject to some of the issues. But it's really more about we want to be as cooperative and open with our users as well as with the governments in any country we work in, but particularly in China, to make sure that we're keeping both sides fully clear and informed on what we're willing to do. And I think that's been a key part of it is you know, we're, we're focused on being transparent. Great. Uh, I think we're out of time for questions. So maybe we can all give a round of applause to uh, Linda again. Thanks so much for coming to speak with everybody.